Old Testament prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 34. We read from this passage last Sunday, and I want to return to some of the thoughts that they're uh, being raised here by the prophet for us. Ezekiel chapter 34. For thus says the Lord God, <clears throat> Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, declares the Lord. And I, uh, declares the Lord God, I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. And this is the Lord's word, and we know that he will bless it to our hearts today. Join with me in a word of prayer as we come to the scriptures. Lord Jesus, we sit at your feet again, and we ask that you will enable us to incline our ears, incline the thoughts of our minds and the attitudes of our hearts towards you. Lord, we confess the weakness of the flesh, we confess our powerlessness by ourselves, against every distraction of the enemy. And so, Lord, we plead for your grace and for your power. And we pray again that we will see Jesus in all the fullness and sufficiency of his grace toward us. We ask today that he will be heard speaking into our hearts, that individually, Lord, we might receive that word and bring forth the fruit of it in our lives. Forgive the one, Lord, who speaks for his sins are many. The grant unto us, Lord, that we might be hidden behind the cross, and that none might be seen save Jesus only. For this we ask in his all-worthy name. Amen. Back in the 19th century in England, a Church of England pastor, evangelical pastor, wrote the words of a beautiful hymn that I am sure is familiar to most, if not all of us. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. These words by Pastor Henry Baker were based upon the Welsh version of Psalm 23. And you will have recognized that, I'm sure, as we quoted the words of the first verse, I nothing lack if I am his. Based on Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We've been reflecting over these last number of Sundays on the ongoing ministry of our living Lord to his people. We have made the remark again and again, and we need to, for the good of our souls, that he is and that he always will be our shepherd. And that ministry as a shepherd is essential for us. We need him. We need him every hour. There's not a second of time goes past when we can say to the Lord, we are sufficient now of ourselves for this matter, and uh, thank you very much all the same for your promised assistance. No, my friends, we do need him. We need him because in the words that we sang together in that lovely hymn, uh, Come thou find of every blessing. The last verse says this, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Never think of those words, but if I just give you this aside, I know of a particular church 
where a man in a congregation went to the elders of the church and objected to that verse being sung. He said, prone to wander? He says, I'm not prone to wander. Well, I saw the report that the church decided they wouldn't sing those words anymore. <clears throat> the triality is, brethren and sisters, that that dear brother didn't know the reality of the tendency of his own heart. Because this is true for you and for me that we have within us an old nature, the flesh, the old man, in various ways it's described in Scripture, which is corrupt as it ever was, and which contains within it a principle that leads us constantly to departure from the Lord. And that's why we need a shepherd. You know, of course, that the tendency of the sheep is to wander. And that's what we read about in the 34th chapter of Ezekiel, how that the Lord, when he would exercise the office of a shepherd, he would bring back those who had wandered. He would bring back those who had been scattered. We need this ministry not only because we are prone to wander, but because we are the prey to our enemies. We know that we have, just as sheep have, and as you know, the sheep is perhaps one of the most vulnerable of all animals. It lacks any capacity really for self-defense. It is in need of constant care and constant protection because there's all kinds of predators out there that are seeking to rend and tear and devour the sheep. And just like the sheep, you and I, as the sheep of God's flock, are the object of Satan's malice. We are the target of the enemy's attacks. We are warned by the Apostle Peter to be sober and to be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. If ever there was a time, certainly in my life and probably in your life's experience, where looking out in the world and in the culture in which God has placed us, we can see the evidences of the circling of the wolves around the flock of God. What is, it ne what is necessary for us? when the wolves are circling, and that is to stay very, very, very close to our shepherd. His role as the shepherd is essential, and it is a role that is exercised by him. It is exercised by him comprehensively, because our needs are comprehensive and extensive. It is exercised by him constantly, unlike the unfaithful shepherds of Israel to whom Ezekiel was directed to write, the Lord will not be unfaithful in the exercise and discharge of his responsibility when all fails around us and when all is unfaithful toward us, the Lord remains faithful. And as the shepherd, he constantly watches over his own. And as he exercises his ministry comprehensively, and constantly he does so compassionately. He does so because he is the heart that is filled with abiding and eternal and overflowing affection for every one of us who have been bought by his blood. Dear child of God, the Lord loved you and I to the extent that he sent his son to suffer the agony and the agony of the cross at Calvary and bore, bearing the wrath of God in our place. And he loved you too much and he paid too much for you to give you over as a victim and as a prey to all of the adversaries of our souls. He remains our shepherd. I say his ministry is comprehensive because our needs are extensive. And his ministry is not only extensive, his ministry is effective. That brings us to the very opening statement of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yahweh, the word for Lord, is my shepherd. Yahweh, Rohi, is the Hebrew. And because the Lord is our shepherd, therefore we can say, we shall not want. We shall not want. It's interesting, this last part of the first verse of Psalm 23 is translated in different ways, each of which is very valid. The MIV translates it, The Lord is my shepherd, I, I shall lack nothing. The New Light translation says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall have all that I need. And the message, which I have to say to you, is not so much a translation, but a paraphrase. 
The message says, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't need a thing. I don't need a thing. I was just struck again in the uh, choice of the hymns for today. Uh, how this very theme is, is underlined. And there's, there's no uh, cooperation between Jim and I on the choice of the hymns. I leave that entirely to him. And he doesn't know from one Sunday to the next what I'm going to say from the pulpit, which is probably a good thing. Um, but he chose this hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's not exactly what we have in our shepherd. He is the fount of every blessing. Or another hymn writer penned the words, Every need he is supplying, Every good in him I see, On his strength divine relying, He is all in all to me. Every need. Isn't it good that when the Lord left the scene of time, bodily to ascend to heaven and sit down at the right hand of his Father. He didn't basically say to us, now get on with it yourselves. No, he continues to minister to us. And he continues to, to minister to us in the ways that we find in Psalm 23, to which we have gone again and again in these last number of weeks. Think of every need that the shepherd is supplying. Think of every extremity in which the sheep finds itself which is met by the intervention and the dispensing of grace by the hand of the shepherd. We've looked at some of them. We've thought of those words in, in the 23rd Psalm, He restores my soul. Don't we always need to be restored? We thought of those words, He anoints my head with oil last week. And in thinking about those words, we thought about the fact that this is not a change of metaphor in the 23rd Psalm. This is rather a reference to the practice of the Palestinian shepherd of ancient days who put oil on the sheep's head uh, to uh, give it so soothing and healing and cure from the affliction of the termites and the mites and the bugs and all of the rest of it that would irritate it and cause it all kinds of distress. So the Lord ministers as the restoring shepherd. He ministers as the healing shepherd. And then last week we thought about how he ministers as the strengthening shepherd. And while that is not specifically referred to in Psalm 23, it is in Ezekiel 34 because he talks about, I will strengthen the weak. So here we have it all. Every need he is supplying. You could say our, our amen to that, but we're not done yet. Uh, not, not by a long shot. We want to look again at another way in which the Lord meets our need as the shepherd. And again in Psalm 23, and we've said these words very often as you've quoted the psalm, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, uh, the reason why there are some commentators who believe there is a change in metaphor in the middle of the 23rd psalm that moves from the shepherd's sheep metaphor to the host and guest metaphor is because they, have, they look at this reference, for example, to anointing and the table and the cup, and they say, well, this is, these are words which allude to a, a guest uh, or someone who has been invited to a feast. But I would beg to differ. I don't think the metaphor changes at all, as we saw in the anointing of the head with oil, and that that was something indeed which shepherds did in those days. But what about this, this statement? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. A book that I would recommend to you is by a former shepherd, Philip Keller, who wrote the book on 23rd Psalm. I think it's entitled, The Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. And he points out that in the 23rd Psalm, there is a definite progression of movement. The flock is being led. They're being led by the still waters. They're being led into the green pastures. But they're also being led through the valley of the shadow. They're being led in, in, uh, in situations where there are enemies on every hand. And hence the reference to the rod and the staff. Those were implements carried by the ancient Palestinian shepherds, not only for counting and directing the sheep, but also for protecting the sheep from the predators that would want to kill them and steal them. And so there's this onward going progression through the valley of the shadow, and then it ends up eventually 
in the house of the Lord. And when you think of that kind of movement that there is in the psalm, we are therefore given a, an insight into understanding what is being meant when the Lord says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is what Philip Keller says in this regard. The flock, he says, are being brought to the high country of the summer ranges. These are known, this is, these are known as alplands or <coughs> table lands. In some of the finest sheep country in the world, he goes on to say, especially in the western US and in southern Europe, the high plateaus of the sheep ranges are always referred to as mesas, which is the Spanish word for table. So I think we're beginning to clue in here as to what the psalmist is driving at. The flock is being led, it's being led up into the high mountains, it's being led up into the, the tablelands, the mesas of the high country. And so again, as I say, the, the metaphor stands. We're still talking about the shepherd-sheep relationship. Remember who the shepherd is? Let's never forget for one moment that the Lord Jesus identified himself in John 10 as the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. And he is also identified in the book of Hebrews as the great shepherd who was brought from the dead. And Peter identifies him as the chief shepherd who one day will appear and bring us together unto himself. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the one who came and lived and died and rose and ascended for us. He is our shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd for the sheep he bled. Every lamb is sprinkled with the blood he shed. And we are the sheep. Psalm 100. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ and he is providing a table for us. And he's providing for a table, a table for us, we're told, in the very presence of our enemies. I was listening to a preacher yesterday, just in a short uh, video clip, talking about how he puzzled for years over that last part of the statement, in the presence of your enemies. He said, you know, if I was writing that, I would have said, you prepare a table for me in your presence. But that's not what he says. He said, I'm preparing a table for you in the presence of the enemy. The presence, the very presence of the enemy, the Lord in his grace is providing a table for us. Now when we think of this, this word table in scripture, you can think of many references to this. You remember back in the book of Exodus when the Lord was giving instructions to Moses regarding the construction of the tabernacle and all of its uh, articles of furniture and so on inside the holy place. Inside the place that was entered by the first curtain, there were three articles of furniture. There was a golden altar of incense, and there was a candlestick, and there was a table. It was called the table of showbread. Showbread simply means the presence. This is the bread of the presence. And there were 12 loaves and they were placed upon that table and replaced on a regular basis. You come across into the scriptures and you find the people of God and they're going through the wilderness. And this is referred to in Psalm 78 verses 19 and 20. When the Lord charged them with saying this, will the Lord provide a table in the wilderness? Will the Lord provide a table in the wilderness? And there are at least two instances that that could be referring to when the people complained that they had lack of food. The people complained because they were sick and tired of eating the manna every day and they were wondering how God was going to feed them. And this is the way it was put. Will the Lord provide a table in the wilderness? And then when you come across a little further in Scripture to the second book of Samuel and you remember in chapter 9 there's this beautiful story of how David having ascended the throne of Israel, asks the question, is there yet any of the house of Saul that I might show unto him the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake? And you know the story how he sends for Mephibosheth. And on no less than three occasions in that chapter, David makes it clear that Mephibosheth is going to sit at my table. 
over and over again, three times. It's going to sit at my table. He's going to sit at my table. So here's another reference to the table, the table of the king. Keep that in mind. And then, of course, this morning, what did we do? We came to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21, the table of the Lord. So the Bible speaks of tables. Now, when you think about a table, I think uh, I would be uh, confident in saying, without fear of contradiction, that the first thing that probably comes to your mind is food. That's normally where we eat. Uh, some of us sort of eat on the go or eat in the car or eat with our feet up on a, a, a lazy boy or something like that. But normally, the table is the place where we gather for food. And so we're beginning to understand here what the Lord is talking about when he talks about preparing a table. Did you notice very interestingly in Ezekiel 34, and uh, especially in verses 13 and 14 and 15 of the chapter, that the Lord says on each, on each of these verses, he says it in a different way, but uh, he essentially repeats the fact, he says, I will feed my flock. Verse 13, I will feed my flock. Verse 15, I will feed my flock. So that this is the table the Lord's providing. He's providing food for his flock. And just by the way, did you notice in passing that when the Lord promised he was going to feed his flock, he said, I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. That fitted exactly to what we've been talking about, about the sheep being taken up into the upper lands, up into the table lands, up into where there's that good pasture and good grazing for the flock. The Lord said, this is where I'm going to take them, and this is going to how I'm going to feed them. I will prepare a table for them in the presence of our enemies. So, what is the Lord talking about here in this psalm? What is the ministry of the exalted Christ to his people? It is to provide food for our souls. That's what it's all about. Providing a table, a table that is loaded with the best that grace can provide and everything that we can possibly need for the nourishment and the strengthening of our souls in the Lord. And when you think of this fact, the provision for our souls, isn't that exactly the way God presents the gospel in Scripture? There are many aspects and many facets of the gospel that we can, we can look at in the Word of God. But you'll find that the Lord comes again and again in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, to this figure of a provision of food for a hungry soul. Think of Isaiah 55. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. He that has no money, come ye buy and what? Eat. Ye come by wine and milk without money and without price. And he abrades the people for spending their money on that which is not bread and expending their labor on that which cannot satisfy. So he's using the figure again of coming to eat something, coming to drink something. A provision that is made for a necessity that is seen. And then, of course, when you come to the New Testament and you come to the story of the prodigal son, no less, in Luke 15, what happened when he came home? Remember, that was our definition of repentance. Repentance is coming home. Turning the back on the far country with its swine troughs and all of the degradation that goes with it and coming home to the Father. What happened when he came home? Well, remember what the father said, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. He's coming home to a feast. He's coming home to a provision. And then we have the same thought illustrated in the two great parables in Scripture which refer to a banquet or a supper. In Luke chapter 14, a certain man made a great supper and invited many. And, you know, the, the whole rest of the parable and how it talks about the invitation going out and some refusing and so on and so forth. But it's all, it's all illustrative and pictorial of the gospel. It's a feast that has been prepared. It's a provision that has been made. The same thing in Matthew 22 in the parable of the marriage feast of the king's son. You have this, you have this emphasis upon a great provision, a great banquet that has been laid out to which people have been invited. And so this is the table 
the table of the gospel, the table of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, all that has been made by God in his love and kindness and mercy to sinners, and to which they are freely invited in the gospel invitation. Three things I just want to refer to quickly about this provision, this table that the Lord has prepared for us in the presence of his enemies. Three words you remember. Number one, we'll talk about the provision of the table. Secondly, very simply, the preparation of the table. And finally, we'll look at the proclamation to come and sit down and feast at this table. The provision. The provision. What can we say about what God has provided for our souls? We can say this, that everything that God has provided is appropriate to and adapted to the need that we have. In other words, it is exactly what our souls require. What do our souls require? The question then has to be asked. Well, by nature, and again, we could go into many verses in the Bible that bring this truth home to us. The sinner is described in many ways. He's described as estranged from God and needs to be reconciled. He is described as being guilty and needs to be pardoned. But he's also described as hungry and thirsty. You see, man, since the fall, has a kind of emptiness inside him. He longs, he hungers, to use the word. He thirsts for many things. He thirsts for acceptance. He thirsts for fulfillment. He hungers for contentment. He hankers after happiness. Now, that's the explanation for the behavior in which man by nature engages. I quote it to you the words of Blaise Pascal, a French theologian and and a philosopher of a previous generation when he talked about all men seek happiness. This is the end to which they are uh, striving in all of their efforts and in every decision that they make. And man seeks to fill this emptiness. He seeks to satisfy this hunger. He seeks to slake this thirst in, in, in many, many ways. And we could go over all of those this morning. He seeks it everywhere. And anywhere, people pursue pleasure, they will pursue possessions, they will pursue positions and prestige and power and all of those things. And at the end of the day, it's to try and satisfy a hunger that is within them. And the sad reality is that in all of their pursuit, they can't find it. And they come to the conclusion, if they are going to be honest at all, or at least they will eventually come to the conclusion, that the writer of Ecclesiastes came to when he said that all is vanity and vexation of spirit. I could go through all of those uh, peas in that peapod that I just referenced. Possessions and power and prestige and pleasure and all the rest of it. And I could give you examples and illustrations of people who had those things to the maximum. And yet, there was still the craving, there was still the hunger, there was still the lack of satisfaction. They cannot find it anywhere, though they seek it everywhere. You see, the thing is, God has put eternity in our hearts. Was it C.S. Lewis? I believe it was, who made the comment that if we find that there is nothing in this earth that can satisfy us, nothing in this world that can satisfy us. The most likely explanation is we were made for another world. So we look at the provision, the provision that God has made. And it's a provision that's adapted to meet the hunger of the soul. You think if you go through Isaiah 55 and look no further than that, the ways in which the Lord extends the invitation and he's using figurative language, we know he's using metaphorical speech. And first of all, he, he, he talks about God's provision as being water. Oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. He talks about it as being bread. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? 
He talks about it as being wine, by wine, he says. And he talks about it as being milk. You've got four foods there. You've got water, bread, wine, and milk. And they are deliberately chosen by the Holy Spirit for specific reasons. How essential is water? Water is necessary to life. It cannot be sustained without life. And the Lord himself calls us to the water. And remember that the Lord himself is the one who provides the water. We could think of the illustration of that at the rock at Rephidim. You remember that Moses struck the rock, the rock and the waters gushed out and the, and the thirsty people were satisfied. There's the gospel, friends. There's God adapting his provision to the need that they have. They were thirsty. What did they need? They needed water. God gives us, friends, and our souls what our souls most require. I was listening, coming down to a, a sermon this morning on, on John chapter 4. The Lord Jesus comes to the Samaria. He talks to the woman at the well. What does he, what does he offer to her? He offers to her living water. If you knew the gift of God, he says, and who it was that said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. And then, of course, there's bread. Bread is called in Scripture the staff of life. The staff of life. That upon which uh, all of it depends. And remember how that the Lord himself, in John's Gospel, chapter 6, and he said that he was the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. He was the fulfillment. He was the antitype of the type of the manna which came down from heaven, the angel's food. As we read in Psalm 78 that God gave the people to Israel to eat. And you remember he said, as he spoke to his people on that day, he said, you, Moses didn't give you the manna. He says, my father gave you the manna. This is the bread from heaven. And he says, just as the manna was given, so by the Lord has given me to be the bread for your soul, to satisfy the hunger of your heart. What can we say about wine? Buy wine and milk, he says, without money and without price. When you look at scripture, you'll discover that wine is a symbol of joy. Wine, it says in scripture, makes glad the heart of God and of men. Oh, my friends, isn't it true that we want to be glad? We want to know what joy is? I suppose there are some people who may, do, who may be uh, happy in their misery. But I think that the, the average individual doesn't want to stay in a morbid and miserable situation. They want joy. They want happiness. And the Lord himself says, listen, not only will I give you joy, but I am your joy. David said God was his chiefest joy. And then, of course, milk. Milk, almost the complete food, they tell us. And there, in, in, in that one thing, God has provided, you know, a, a, a fullness, a comprehensive fullness for our needs. We're talking about the table that the Lord has set. And on that table, there is everything that is adapted to the need of the soul, symbolized in these foods, water, milk, bread, and wine. But not only is the provision of God adapted to our need, the provision of God is abundant in its supply. Abundant in its supply. There's one great feature of God. And it's this, that he's generous. Generosity is a divine attribute. And God is generous. When he gives, he doesn't give it out to us like a sort of a skinflint Ebenezer Scrooge type. Who's just saying, this is what I'll give you and no more. And just be glad you've got anything at all type of attitude. No, when God gives, he gives in abundance. I love the word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 1 when he talks about how God lavishes, lavishes his grace upon us. Go back again to some of those figures that we referred to earlier in the provision of God. You, you think of the rock at Rephidim where the rock was struck and the water came out. You know what it says in the Psalms? It says that the water gushed out. It wasn't just a little trickle or a little drop. Here was an abundance of a supply that God gives. And that's why Paul could say as he reflected upon his own life and testimony, he says, the grace of God, he says to me, was abundant. Abundant grace. You look at how the Lord describes 
these uh, tables that he loads with his provision. And I use the word load very intentionally. It's referred to in Luke 14 as a feast. As a feast. Look at the reception for the returning prodigal in Luke chapter 15. The fat of calf was killed. The best was given. Friends, this morning that which God provides at his table for the need of our hungry and thirsty and joyless and needy souls comes to us in abundant supply. Grace, said the hymn writer, is flowing like a river. Millions there have been supplied, still it flows as fresh as ever from the Saviour's wounded side. There's abundant grace. There is the exceeding riches of his grace. This is the provision of God. This is God's table that he has prepared for us. And everything on that table is there that is adapted to the needs of our souls and it's abundant in its supply toward us. Secondly, notice the preparation of the table. Notice how he says, you prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And remember how that when we come to the New Testament and we think of the table of the banquet of the marriage of the king's son in Matthew 22 and 4, when the king sent out his servants to invite those who had been begotten, he says, I have prepared my dinner. I have prepared it. This provision was prepared. But you know, when you think about this word preparation, it has a couple of ideas in it. It's the idea, first of all, of planning. Now, of course, you think of, of any banquet, it involves a great deal of organization and planning has to go into it and so on. And uh, everybody who's involved and what will be bought and what will be put on the table and who will sit where and so on and so forth. It all has to be planned. Friends, God has planned from all eternity to give grace to sinners. And it's all in his plan. You notice even how the king said in Matthew 22, 4, he says, I have prepared my dinner. Oh, I'm sure the king himself didn't go down and put the tablecloths on and set the plates and the cutlery on the table. No, he did that through his servants. But nevertheless, it was all in his mind. It was all conceived by him. It was all planned by him. Friends, isn't it wonderful to know that before the foundation of the world, God had planned to send a Savior to meet the needs of our souls. He was the lamb slain. As we read in Revelation before the foundation of the world. But there's not only the thought of planning. There's the thought of price. You prepare a banquet, it's going to cost. And the king's banquet. We just recently had the coronation of the king. And the great banquet that followed. I'm sure it didn't just cost a few cents or a few dollars. It was costly. It had to be paid for and friends, the provision that God has made for us in the Lord Jesus Christ was a costly provision. It cost him his life. It cost him the shedding of his blood. It cost him the sacrifice of himself. It cost him the suffering of, him, of his soul. And though it comes to us, as we will see just in a second or two as we conclude, and though it comes to us, as Isaiah said in chapter 55, without money and without price. Yet we also remember the words of 1 Peter 1, that we are not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. It costs the suffering and the sacrifice of Calvary. That's the preparation. And then finally, the proclamation. We're just, again, Basing this upon the invitations that the king sent out in Matthew 22, that the Lord of the banquet sent out in Luke chapter 14. And as I reflected on these well-known parables of the word of God, I couldn't help but rejoice in my soul again as I thought about the extent of this proclamation, or if you like, the extent of this invitation that was given. You know, those who were bidden refused to come. We know that story. 
But then the king said to his servants, Go out again and bring him in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And they did that. And then they come back again and they said, Yet there is room. And then the Lord sent them out again and he says, Go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in that my house might be filled. Can't you see the extent of the proclamation here? When you think of the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind, when you think of those who are living in the highways and byways, what word comes to mind? The outcasts, those who are marginalized, the others in society, those people, if we want to use that kind of terminology. And does this emphasize again and again the heart of God for those who are even rejected by their fellow men, those who are on the fringes of society, for some reason or another, maybe their morality, maybe their, their fallenness, maybe their addictions, maybe their whatever. And did you ever notice something about the ministry of the Savior, that these were the very people that he made a beeline for to serve? Now, there was no us and them as far as he was concerned. There was no one beyond his grace. There was no one beyond the pale of his mercy. There was no one outside the invitation of his gospel. I just wonder, my friends, I ask myself the question this morning, do we have something of the heart of Christ in that regard? How easy it is for us to other people and to talk about those people and so on and so forth and to regard some people as beyond are not worthy of our compassion or our mercy or our grace. Well, friends, if that is so, then we are not walking in the steps of the man of sorrows who had nothing but compassion for the rejects of society, the extent of the proclamation. In other words, no one is excluded. It goes out to all. It goes out even to the worst of sinners. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. And then again, we think not only of its extent, but its expense, and I've alluded to this already. How much did it cost those who received the invitation? What was the expense? Zero. They didn't, didn't need to pay a bean. You see, it had all already been paid for by the king. The provision that cost him so much was free to them. Isaiah 55 again, to which we've alluded again and again, O oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. He that has no money, come ye buy and eat. Ye come buy wine and milk without money and without price. You know, that, that, that ought to thrill our souls, that God lavishes the grace that our souls need upon us, at the cost of the blood and death of his son on the cross, and he lavishes upon us freely, he holds out to us as a gift, that we reach out with empty and sin-stained hands to take unto ourselves. And yet there is something about man's depravity that he's offended. He's offended by the freeness of God's grace. He wants to do something. He wants to contribute something. He doesn't want to be un under obligation to grace and to grace alone. That's why God often has in the process of dealing with the soul to bring an, in an individual to the place where they realize that they have nothing. Oh, that was always true, but they didn't see it. They didn't realize it. And they had to be brought sometimes by a process of deep conviction to realize with top lady, and he said in his hymn, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. This is a proclamation that has the most extensive reach and scope. It goes out to all, the worst and the least and the lost. Its expense to those who are invited, it is absolutely free. And this proclamation is so earnest. If you have been invited in recent days to Buckingham Palace, to the banquet celebrating the coronation of the monarch, would you not have seen that as a great honor conferred upon you? Would you not have seen that as a great privilege, a unique opportunity, and something that was not to be missed? 
to be able to tell your children and your grandchildren, you know, I was at the palace the day the king was crowned. I sat at the celebratory banquet. And yet when we come to the gospel and we think of the magnitude and the magnificence and the greatness of God's offer of grace in the gospel and what he has provided and what he promises to those who will come and freely receive it, yet we are like those who are referred to in Luke 14. We all begin to make excuse. What is it that stops us laying hold on such a glorious opportunity as this? A glorious privilege such as this. And so when the messengers go out, they go out with the king's word ringing in their ears. Compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. Bring every argument to bear. Bring all the reasoning that you can to their attention. Plead with them. Beseech them. Entreat them. Do all that you can, but compel them to come in. Why? Because God's in earnest about all of this. God's in earnest to bless us. And yet in our folly we back off and say, no, I've got other things more important. I prepare us a table before me. That table to which God in his grace has brought us who have believed is still the same table that nourishes our souls. Our food is still Christ. That which gives us joy, the wine uh, that is spoken of in Isaiah 55, it's still Christ. The bread of heaven is still Christ. The water that slake our, our thirsty soul, it's still Christ. And this is a banquet prepared for us. Thou preparest the table before me. It can literally be translated, Thou preparest a table for me. Thou preparest a table for me. And even as the wolves and the lions are looking on, and the hyenas and the jackals and the foxes are looking on, the shepherd stands at his table loaded with provision for his flock. And he feeds their hungry souls. <clears throat> Who would not rejoice? And such a shepherd as this. <coughs> Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithful and constant and compassionate ministry to our souls. Truly we can say that if the Lord is our shepherd, we can lack nothing. That every need he is supplying. That he is the fount of every blessing. That he is the one to whom we can go in the hunger of our hearts, in the thirst of our souls, in the misery of our spirits. And in all of our spiritual malnutrition, Lord, we can find it met in Christ alone, who provides himself, who laid his own body upon the wood of a table of called the cross, in order that he might provide us with all that was needed and all that would bring joy and pleasure to our souls. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for grace. In Jesus' name, amen.